every day you wake up and you want to achieve, make sure you're very clear and understanding what you want to achieve, what that outcome is. But secondly, know what the process is to, out, uh, to achieve that outcome. Hello, everyone. Welcome, all of you, to this special video session. Most of you who have been following me on various social media platforms and those who know me outside have always seen that I've been sharing a lot of knowledge, experiences that I've had in my career. All of this I had been doing with a single focused agenda of making sure that we can inspire and help as many people as possible in their journeys to success. And the reason I do this is because I feel God has been kind to give me experiences of working in multicultural environments in different roles and with different kinds of people. And I feel I have a duty to spread this knowledge, this love, and this experience with as many people as I can. I thought of expanding it beyond the knowledge that I've been sharing. And as part of that, launching a series of sessions with some eminent thought leaders and high performance stalwarts around the world. I'm extremely pleased to welcome Simon Helmet. Simon Helmet is an Australian high performance sports coach who has been coaching international teams right from the T20 teams in India, Bangladesh, the Caribbeans, apart from also providing his knowledge and expertise in the Aussie grown aspiring sports talents. He's also looking at executive level coaching for organizations. His expertise in sports is invaluable for us, and I would be not taking more time but to welcome Simon into this video chat. Simon, welcome to this chat. It's a pleasure having you here. Uh, thank you very much, Ash. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for, uh, for me being your very first guest, I believe. Uh, I look forward to talking uh, with you, uh, your experiences as well. I know that you've spent a lot of time here in Australia, as I have over the last decade spent a lot of time in the subcontinent. So thanks for having me. And I'm looking forward to discussing all things, uh, all things business uh, and, and also discussing maybe some of the linkages that we have uh, with cricket and sport in, in business. Yeah, I'm, I'm really honoured to have you as my first guest, to be, honored, to be honest. Now, let me start with that. You know, I think you, you raised a very uh, interesting point there about uh, you being in India and me being in Australia. I think there's a lot of interesting uh, things we can talk about, but we should, not, we should not start this conversation without asking about the weather from where you are from, which is Melbourne. Very famous for its weather. So how is the weather out there today? Well, Ash, I'm sitting in a, in a suburb called Surrey Hills, and I know it's only a few kilometres away to where you spent a lot of time uh, living here in Melbourne, Australia, when you were cutting your teeth in the business uh, industry. And uh, Melbourne today is your typical normal day uh, in autumn. Sunshine, rain, cloud, <laughs> sunshine, rain and cloud again. <laughs> that, that sounds like Melbourne. Like that. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds exactly like Melbourne. Yeah. And I'm sure you can't wait to get back to the beach and uh, do a bit of surfing and swimming as well. Too, co too cold today, but yes, yeah, so I hope they'll be in the surf. My daughter was in the surf this week, actually. They've just opened the beaches back up in Australia. You couldn't go there for a couple of weeks, but uh, now, uh, yeah, they've been out there surfing. Uh, I'll go down for a run later on in the local oval and get, get some fresh air. Excellent. And I think let's also remind the viewers that anywhere in the world, whoever is listening, please be safe. Please follow the social distancing. Please follow the norms given by each of your governments because what we don't want is breaking the laws and getting any kind of infection. So let's remind the viewers about that before we start. Simon, I was very curious when I was reading about you, I was very curious to understand a little bit about your background, basically your upbringing. And the reason I ask is I think every one of us is a product of our upbringing, the environment we grew in. So could you just throw some light about your family background and what were the two or three key learnings? Uh, came from a very uh, happy upbringing. Um, parents uh, are, are were separated at a very young age, but that certainly didn't change any way in which uh, my family uh, worked. Uh, I suppose if I, if I talked about some key elements that I, or takeaways from, from my growing up, uh, always told or reminded to give thanks. Uh, we came from what we'd probably call a middle-class background. Uh, certainly wasn't wealthy. 
Uh, but, uh, we, we obviously take having respect for, for the provisions we were given, the shelter, the warmth and the food. Um, always encouraged to give your best. My brother and I were always encouraged to whatever we wish to try and do uh, to give our best and, uh, and we're very well supported by, by our mum and dad. Um, understanding the importance of giving uh, and serving, that was something that was, uh, was certainly uh, entrenched in our, in our upbringing. And, but most importantly, was unconditional love. Can I ask you, Ash, what was your upbringing like? You know, when I heard yours, it's, it just so feels so um, deja vu, in fact, because what, what is very common is the family spirits in yeah. any part of the world. So my upbringing was very similar as well. You know, I came from a very typical middle class family, grew up in a, you know, in a one room house as a, as a kid. Uh, yeah. My dad was uh, just starting off to work. In fact, mom used to say that when I was born, uh, that's, the, that's the time my dad got a proper job. So right. then he was still finding his feet around and stuff. And so she always considers me a lucky charm for the family. <laughs> and uh, I grew up with a very successful sister who was always uh, top of the rank in the classes and doing extremely well. And uh, the values was, you know, the single biggest value that I always remember from my dad is always to be giving mm. than taking. And he had this, uh, you know, this example to always uh, tell me that when you think of the potholes in India, you know, there is a lot of water during the rainy season. Yeah. And uh, he always says that, do you notice why water stays on a pothole and not on a curved surface, which is more like a upside down bowl? Because water needs a surface to sit mm. and it takes. The surface takes the water. It doesn't throw the water out. So he says, in life, if you bend like a bowl like this, you can take things, you know. But yeah. if you have your chest up and walk around, yeah. you probably won't get anything. So that's the biggest learning I've got from my upbringing, yeah. I would say. Yeah. You know, moving on from that, if you think about your experiences, especially the cross-country experiences, working in Asia, living in Asia, working with, you know, the populations of India, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, the Caribbeans, could you share with us, you know, how was the experience like and what really struck you? And again, you know, a couple of key takeaways you got from them and what did they get from you? Um, look, I'm so blessed to have been able to experience so many different cultures and places. My daughter, Molly, she's 13 now. My son, Jack, 16. They've, they've been to India six times. They've been to oh, Dubai gosh. a couple of times. They've been to the Caribbean three times. They've had some awesome experiences. Um, Suppose a young rookie coach, Ash, uh, too many times I would go into a new place and try and take everything I knew and had learned in coaching in Australia and try and implement it straight away into that new culture. And I very quickly realised that that wasn't the way to be. Uh, what I needed to do is learn about the culture that I was working within. Uh, because different cultures, different teams, different businesses work in different ways. But there are still some key principles uh, that I, I believe are still consistent no matter where you are. Um, and it's not anything new, I reckon, but you know, relationships and developing relationships were key. So whether I'll be working in Bangladesh uh, or in Trinidad or in, indeed in Hyderabad, to develop uh, good friendships, good understandings of how things work was the first key. Second was mutual respect. Uh, I do think I may do things differently to you. You may do it differently to me, but still understand that if it's a good, honest purpose to what's being done, we should respect uh, each other and how we how we're approaching things. Thirdly, I had to adapt. I had to adapt my ways of doing things to ensure that it may have worked, uh, maybe in a new environment. Uh, at, at, the, at the Hyderabad Sunrises, we'd often have some team team bonding games, and the coach Tom Moody would often ask myself to to be the the person to organise. And it was so interesting because it, it, with an IPL team, you've got five or six nationalities within that within that one within that one dressing room, or in right. you know this this particular activity. Uh, and I was always overwhelmed on the enthusiasm and the passion of the of the Indian uh, 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 players, uh, the Caribbean players, just loving, uh, you know, the engagement and the involvement. But I'd try these activities that I do with the Hyderabad Sunrisers in a different environment in Australia or somewhere else, and it didn't always necessarily work the way I did it there. So adapting, um, working in a different environments, and understanding uh, what the team's needs and wants are, are certainly helps. And 
we call this cultural diversity now. And uh, when I go and speak corporately these days, uh, it, it becomes natural to me. Whereas when I first arrived in your in your country or our country, because I know we've both shared both places. Yeah. A lot, um, uh, in 2008, when I first rocked up in Hyderabad uh, with the Australian A team, um, you know, I've seen so much, so much change and, and so much difference uh, into what I see in Hyderabad, you know, 10 to 12 years on. And Ash, I, that sort of leads me into asking you, I, I know I've had a chat with you before. Obviously, you did a lot of business here in Australia, living up the road from where I am. And then you, you had to sneak up north into uh, the sunny state of Queensland. And uh, you've obviously had lots and lots of experiences. Um, it'd be fair to say you come over here as a young man. Uh, yes. I learned the craft and uh, and you probably had to learn some hard lessons and obviously learn more about yourself. But yeah, can you share some of your experiences? So, you know, when I uh, went to Queensland as a general manager for the Queensland business, it was the second biggest organization for us in Queensland. And uh, what was interesting is within the Queensland organization, we had three branches. So we had Brisbane, Gold Coast and North Queensland. And I was leading a team of extremely senior people uh, much more older than me. And, how, um, how, and that time, how old were you? I was 28. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah. I was 28, and, and most of the people reporting to me were 40 plus and uh, thoroughbred um, Australians, Orca Australians, <laughs> I would call them. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I was still then a very naive um, um, a person, you know, coming from India with the brown skin. And uh, it was uh, quite a challenging experience. You know, the first three months, I think uh, the team was still kind of trying to understand what is this guy out here trying to do? You know, does he really know what he's doing? Because I didn't have a trade background. And, you know, in Australia, it's extremely important to have a very good, solid technical background, whatever work you're doing. People come from the trade, uh, doing a TAFE and then apprenticeship programs and stuff. So I had come with a you know, double degree and they saw me as this MBA guy, you know, MBA guy <laughs> who had a lot of knowledge and... Uh, who's probably going to come and tell them theories about uh, business practices and stuff. Uh, so I had to, as you mentioned, you know, adapting. I think I was naturally adapting myself to working with extremely senior people, very knowledgeable people. And my approach was very simple. My approach was, when I first met them, I told them that, you know, we are a team and each one of us bring something to the table. And this is like a movie production, you know, one person is the director, one person is the actor, one person is the cameraman. But if everyone doesn't do their part, the movie is going to be a flop. And yeah. I told them that, you know, I'm not going to be saying that I'm bigger than you or you're smaller than me. We're all the same. We're all the same. But what's important is that we respect each other's knowledge. We don't boss over each other. So I told mm -hmm. them that I'm not your boss, but I'm your colleague and I'm your friend. And I'm going to show you what I know and I need your help to show me what you know. And mm -hmm. I think that really broke the ice. You know, when people realize that I'm not here to, you know, walk around like, um, you know, a big boss commanding and directing people. And when I, as long as I was happy to be hearing them, hearing them out, respecting their views. And, and that's what I did before any decisions, I would always take a bottom up feedback, make sure that it's a team's decision and not my own decision. So that's yeah. what I think really helped me succeed in Queensland. Yeah. And, and you brought up quite a few quite a few business points there that uh, obviously, did you learn that naturally or did someone instruct you? Did you learn those business traits um, through a course or <laughs> how, how did that come about? Because I, I would assume that, that was quite a daunting uh, task that you were given at the time, but quite clearly you've come through it and you've learned from it and developed from it and you've succeeded from it. Very true. You know, I did not have, in fact, I didn't do an MBA. You know, I did a master's in industrial engineering in uh, Swinburne in yeah. Melbourne. Yeah. And um, so I did not have any business background. I think um, I would say two things, right? One is I was extremely fortunate to work with superb leaders. They always groomed and mentored me. Um, and probably also the upbringing from India, you know, the culture of respecting people, as you mentioned in, a, in a, one of the previous conversations we had, you know, that in India, you got the respect just because you were the coach. Yeah. Even before, you know, people knew. So that's, thing, I think it's kind of in my blood. I yeah. think this is probably what helped me. So, and I was also, of course, a voracious reader. I used to read a lot of books. Right. Jack, Jack Welch, uh, you know, the XG chairman was my idol. I used yeah. to read a lot of his books. So it was always sharpening my saw through various sources that I mm. had. 
mm. which is something I really recommend to all the viewers that you got to be constantly sharpening your saw wherever you are in your career, whether you are a CEO or you're entry level person, doesn't matter. Yeah, no, I but, agree. Uh, but you know, when we speak about sports and business, yeah. the one constant challenge I have is all the time, you know, when I uh, give examples to my team about inspiring, we always show them sporting examples. But you know, in sports, people practice a whole year for a season. But in organizations, you know, every month we are closing results, there's quarter closings. So I wanted to ask you as a sport high performance coach, yeah. do you think it's a fair comparison or what is the difference and what could be the, the, the symmetry or the, the, the relationship together as well? Yeah, look, I think there are definitely parallels. Um, but uh, yeah, I think too many times we just think, oh, we'll grab a sporting um, acronym and we're just going to try and throw it into a business or vice versa. I think both can work really well with each other. Uh, often I'll seek um, some business um, attributes and try and take them into into the team that I'm coaching or uh, in the environment that I'm in. So I think both can work really well with each other. But something, um, Ash, that I think is consistent throughout all my discussions with sporting teams and when I've uh, had the opportunity to speak corporately, um, people are often not wanting to talk about or discuss what are the key components of team cohesion, um, strategic planning uh, to achieve success. Uh, yep. for, for a cricket match, it's wins and losses. No doubt uh, in your field, it's uh, profits, profits and losses. Yeah, um, in empowerment, how we get the best out of our staff, and I, I really liked your real-life analogy of, uh, of what happened to you when you are working in Queensland. Um, and then I suppose... Uh, some some later thinkings, I suppose, in, in growth mindsets and and, and diverse thinking. Um, that they're they're parts that I've been working on, uh, not only in the cricket uh, space, but also, you know, real obvious and clear linkages in the um, in, in in business and corporate. But it probably also goes back to those principles we talked earlier uh, about um, relationship building. Adapting to different situations and and respecting the people that you're uh, that you're working or dealing with. I mean, it's it's almost like um, exactly what we do in business. You know, it's almost almost similar. In fact, exactly the same things we do here. And I think that's the parallels that we should be drawing. You know, we shouldn't probably be worrying about I don't have time to practice, but it's about these elements of sports that we can easily imbibe in organizations, right? Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. I remember my first time going to the Caribbean. I was I was a hot-headed coach, and I was very clear on what I wanted to happen in warm-ups. And most cricketers around the world, especially the lads in the Caribbean, they love playing football or you know soccer, as we call it in Australia. They love playing it before a match. But the physios and the coaches get so stressed because what if they roll an ankle? What if they hurt themselves and fall over? So I decided, no, nope, this cannot happen. Uh, Dwayne Bravo was the captain. I said, Dwayne, no soccer before the match. Anyway, <laughs> I saw all, the, all these glum faces and disappointment. And, uh, you know, I could tell these guys were walking on the field. And they weren't feeling great. So I said to the physio, I said, we've got a problem here. <laughs> these, <laughs> these players aren't going onto the field feeling really good about themselves. Anyway, lost the match. I think we are playing against Jamaica, Chris Gale's team. Came off the field. We talked about the match as we debrief, like we do, you know, in business. Debrief. How are we going? How can we improve? Are we adhering to the strategy? Anyway, one of the youngsters puts his hand up and said, Coach, I said, I've got to be honest, uh, you, you, our warm-ups are wrong. You've got to let us play soccer. You've got to let us play football before the, before the warm-up. It just relaxes us. It gets us going. And, you know, it makes us feel good. So I had a chat with the physio. I said, listen, can we just... We'll make some strict rules, no diving, no slide tackles, but can we make sure that, you know, we play soccer before the game and then uh, and then we go on? I'm Excellent. not saying that's the reason why, I'm not saying that's the reason why we won the championship, Ash, but it certainly <laughs> was helpful in, uh, in us obviously performing well. And it took, it didn't just take a leader to remind me in Dwayne Bravo, which he strongly recommended. It took one of the younger players who had the confidence to tell me, coach, we need to change things. That's an amazing example you gave there. You know, you gave an example of humility. You gave an mm. example of a coach can also take an advice from a newbie, which mm. in many organizations I see that, you know, when people start going up the ladder, 
they start uh, not taking the youngsters, the newbies seriously, and they discount mm. their ideas and stuff, which is such a big no-no in my view. But, yeah. you know, I, I can't uh, miss asking you this, you know, because you've been in India so many times and you've engaged with the players. Yeah. Do you have any funny incident to share or any anything, any interesting anecdotes about your time in India? Oh, you put me on the spot there, Ash. I, uh, I'll have to think clearly on that one. But, look, I've got many great experiences. Uh, yeah. Look. The, the great the thing that I found fascinating um, in uh, in India was uh, that not only is cricket a passion and a love, <laughs> but obviously obviously uh, uh, the arts. Uh, people call it Bollywood, but uh, yep. uh, obviously it's uh, a huge part. And so many times uh, players would be asked by a sponsor, etc., to go up there and uh, do a dance or or do a rendition of something in in the uh, in the artistic flavour. And that wasn't my that wasn't what wasn't as good, so I had to go. I think I had one of the sponsors asked uh, a few of players to go and reenact a famous film, and I had to do a James Bond impression. I wasn't very, very good, Ash. I did okay. my best, Bond, James Bond, but we got it done. But I tell you what, I've quite, there's quite a few people like the Shika Darwins of the world. He was natural. He could just get up there and he could command the audience. Who was that? The cricketer, Shika Darwin. He could just oh, get up okay. there and yeah. do the mo. Yuvraj yeah. Singh, Singh, some very good acting skills. Yes. And, then, and then you got people like David Warner and others who are with the Sunrisers were also very good at getting up there under pressure and yeah. uh, and delivering, which is good fun. Coming back to the discussions about yourself, um, you know, whilst you're transitioning into an executive coaching perspective to corporates and stuff, what do you think, you know, uh, what's that you would be able to offer to organisations or to viewers who are listening how could they use the best um, expertise that you have? What are the couple of things that you think you would be able to bring into organizations and individuals from a coaching perspective? Yeah, that's a good question. I think things that have naturally um, come to me are, are obviously areas on leadership, um, how to lead in different environments at different places uh, and achieving you know, different goals. Uh, as a coach, as noted, you would be from a business point of view, the outcomes are critical. But uh, as a young coach, that be I became immersed with the outcome and forgot about all the processes that go that go into to winning games. Correct. Right. Uh, so, sometimes the young coach um, Ash, in, in reflecting, and I've you know I've been in the game as a coach for 20 years now. Um, I'd probably be more concerned about what will happen to me if things don't work out well. Or I forgot that it was actually the team and the individuals and the players were more important. Uh, and that I had to park my ego at the door and understand that I'm there to serve and to develop and improve. And if improvement was that you you improved your forward defence um, or you improved your game, that was just as important as, as winning matches. I had no greater pride in, in coaching a fellow like Aaron Finch, who became the obviously the Australian um, T20 and, and now the one-day captain, seeing him grow and develop as a young man, uh, wow. also in, into now a leader. Uh, so leadership, uh, but but also some of the things I mentioned earlier, um, how how we how we best communicate in different environments, how we can empower people uh, to make sure that uh, we don't possess possess or or think that we know everything all the time, that we can get the best out of others and create create environments to do that. Um, thinking differently uh, in in diverse places, not just in different countries, but in different workplaces and society. Um, how it works for a charity, to how it works for, for, for a business, to how it works for a school or a sporting organisation. So um, I think the words agile we use in the cricket field, <laughs> being yeah. agile in, uh, on the cricket field as a coach, I keep growing and developing and improving as a coach as well as uh, um, my players, most importantly, are developing and growing in, in the areas and the environments that I'm in. That's just a snapshot of some of the things that I've been doing, Ash, but I, I still enjoy listening to people like yourself who, who have been, you know, at the cold face for, for a long time and, and no doubt that you've worked your way up from, you know, from the start to where you are now. Um, yep. And I'm always encouraged to hear from you uh, there's some of the some of the places and the things that you've done and, and how you can actually uh, keep developing others, as you said at the intro. Yes. So, you know, the, um, the first thing that always strikes my mind is the multicultural experiences working in Australia first, and then Vietnam, Malaysia, and now in India. And I always believe that people should always um, experience variety in life. 
it's important not to be stuck with the same thing, doing the same thing forever. And I've seen that it, it bears out people. You know, you got to put yourself out there for opportunities that you may probably think that it's a bit tough. Get yourself out of the comfort zone. You know, go and try and do things that you always thought it's going to be impossible. Uh, and, and that's that's going to make you a better person every day. And you never yeah. get bored. You know, even though I'm working in the same organization for 14 years, because I've worked in four different countries, four different cultures, four different languages, food, the type of clothes they wear, you know, you learn a lot of things and that keeps you energized and excited all the time. Mm. The second thing that I always like to say is that make your team succeed so that they want you to succeed as well. Mm. To a point where maybe one day your staff can become your boss. And that's not a bad thing. You know, you should have that humility and keep your ego, as you said, on the doorstep and um, never feel that you always have to be the top uh, of the you know, top of the company. If somebody else is doing a better job, put him or her in front. And um, of course, you know, inclusivity and diversity encourage all types of people. I think it's important that we have to be inclusive as a person before you become an inclusive leader, respecting mm. everybody's thought processes. I yeah. think these are critical uh, learnings that I've taken in my life. Hey, Ash, can I ask you another question? Um, during your journey, um, have you had uh, mentors or, or people that, who have assisted you and helped you uh, along along the way? Yes, all the time. I still have a mentor. You know, the first uh, boss that I mentioned, Fernando Xavier, continues to be my mentor for the last 14 years in the, in the organization. I also seek out external mentors, uh, people like yourself. Uh, I have had a lot of people always wanting to support me uh, informally and formally as well. So I think it's incredibly important and a good question you asked as well, which I would actively encourage everyone to have some kind of a mentor or a coach to help you, guide you, correct mm. you, to scold you, you know, all those things. Yeah, it's it's sure. extremely important. Yeah, no, I uh, certainly I, I agree with you. And I think over my journey too, especially, you know, uh, having uh, new experiences and, and coaching new teams or, or coming up with different situations, it's always good, isn't it, to have a person that you can go to. You might go to a different person. You might have one or two or three people. Uh, sometimes they can be family members. Sometimes out. Sometimes people outside of that. But um, certainly having people uh, to 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 rest on and lean on uh, during times of difficulty uh, yeah. is certainly helpful. Uh, and mentoring certainly something that I've found as important. I've always found mentoring is good to have developed a relationship with that person. I find Correct. it difficult times when the mentor is placed upon you. I, I found that difficult to understand. I know it's happened in the past in different places. I, I just think a relationship with a person first, and then I think it naturally evolves that that person becomes a becomes a mentor. Excellent. Simon, we're almost at the end of our conversation, and I would like to finish off this conversation asking you the last question, which is for all the listeners today and all the aspiring people who are you know, going to be tuning into our session, can you just give them two points a key message that would be something that they can carry with them. Yeah, sure. I suppose it's something I mentioned a little bit earlier. Every day you wake up and you want to achieve, make sure you're very clear and understanding what you want to achieve, what that outcome is. But secondly, know what the process is to, uh, to achieve that outcome. Yes, have a real strong plan of what you want to achieve, but also have something outside, outside of that. Most importantly, if you enjoy what you do, has a good chance uh, you're uh, you're going to do it well. What about you? I would um, I would say humility. Always, you know, on a on a receiving end of, of knowledge and giving knowledge. And finally, making sure that you always have a bigger purpose in life, and it's not just about yourself. Mm. You know, God has been kind to us, so we always have to be thinking about. How do we help maybe 10 people more mm. to get them become better and better? Yeah. I think we've had some excellent uh, exchanges, you know. So your thought of having a goal, be fit and have fun. And my thought of humility, having a bigger purpose. I think some, some very strong messages out there. It was a pleasure talking to you, Simon. I think it's an extremely concise conversation, a very deep conversation. And I hope that you have... Amazing success. Let's 
also pray and fight this virus out of this world as soon as possible. And we're all hoping that we can get out there, have fun, have a drink, and be blessed always. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ash, for having me. And uh, thanks for sharing the discussion with you. I hope things go well for you, your business, and your family. I look forward to coming over and seeing you hopefully sooner rather than later and echo all your words and hopefully, um, yeah, we can overcome this situation. Uh, anything you need down the road uh, in, uh, in Kew or Hawthorne where you used to live, just let me know if you left anything yeah. there. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll, Thank you we'll, so we'll much. Catch up. Yeah. Thank you. Take care.